Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening on podcast, please make sure to leave a review. This allows my content to get in front of more people. My name is Judy Cho, and I am board certified in holistic nutrition. I focus on root cause healing, and oftentimes that starts with the Carnivore Cures meat-only elimination diet. Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Sean O'Mara. We had a little bit of technical difficulty, so about nine minutes in, you'll kind of catch that. But otherwise, it was such an amazing interview. Dr. Sean O'Mara is a performance and longevity doctor. He is a researcher, speaker. He is a 2016 NSF grant recipient, and he is part of the nonprofit MedCon Wellness, which is a unique executive and professional athlete practice. And he is part of the MedCon Wellness where they use a lot of science and nature and technology to get the best in class results to reverse chronic disease, as well as human performance optimization. In the interview, you'll hear that Dr. Sean O'Mara was a lawyer, as well as now he is a researcher and a medical doctor. I love that he shared that a lot of his work is really about improving people's wellness and not just about making money and things like that. I love that Dr. O'Mara is really here to share wellness because he really wants people to get better. And you'll hear that in his story about why he even started everything that he's doing today. We talk a lot about the differences of subcutaneous fat versus visceral fat and why it's actually really important to keep tabs on this. You know, we talk a lot about how a lot of people will look outwardly thin, but maybe internally they are starting to show disease. And Dr. America talks about how one way is to just check your visceral fat levels. And we talk about how you can check your visceral fat. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. O'Mara. I'm so excited to have you on. I had several requests of um, people in the community that really wanted me to speak with you. So I'm so excited. I love all the information you share on Instagram and just your messaging about how important it is to check certain things that we are not necessarily looking at. So for some of the people that may not know you, if you can just introduce yourself. Sure. So uh, I am a physician formally trained in emergency medicine. So I Temple University School of Medicine in Philadelphia, and uh, I had previously worked in law enforcement, was a criminal prosecutor, and so because of my background, uh, I uh, elected to apply for a scholarship through the Army to get my medical training because I, I had so many school loans out uh, by, that, by that point that I decided that uh, you know, a army scholarship would be something that I could do uh, with my law enforcement background. So I entered uh, the army and trained in emergency medicine. And in fact, uh, uh, I'm still in the army. I took a, had a little break in service for about 10 years, but I'm currently active duty with the Minnesota Army National Guard. And uh, so I, uh, about 10 years ago, was a pretty unhealthy, middle-aged, 48-year-old uh, physician you know, I would say mildly obese, pre-diabetic, clogged arteries, restless leg syndrome, and large prostate, waking up four to five times a night to to pee. I had obstructive sleep apnea, eczema, and Barrett's esophagus, which is, for those who aren't familiar, it's a very severe form of gastroesophageal reflux disease. So having to be scoped every three months to follow my precancerous lesions that were lining my, my stomach and my esophagus at that point. So lots of, you know, significant and severe medical conditions. And then I encountered a patient that uh, was really healthy. And he told me, you know, that I should cut out carbs and, and uh, eliminate processed foods. And I didn't know anything about it. I just started doing that. And, and after one year, I noticed that every one of my medical conditions, when I did that, went away either completely or improved. And I, I mean, so dramatically that I felt like a fraud. I felt like such a fake individual, you know, thinking myself as a professional with a doctoral degree. And yet not one minute had I spent in my medical training or my medical career advocating what had the single most dramatic impact on my health in my lifetime, just cutting out processed foods, and basically eating clean. So I was so dismayed um, over this experience that I decided that I had to become a researcher 
to take a look at what was behind this dramatic change in my health and my physiology. So I end up uh, joining forces with a uh, physician, a great physician uh, by the name of Dr. Zhang up in Minneapolis. And he, he had a research practice that I joined and worked with him for about seven years. And we ended up uh, applying for a grant for the, for, uh, with the National Science Foundation to study the reversal of chronic disease. And when we set out, we decided that we would look at uh, where there was an absence of chronic disease among species, and that's in animals in the wild. And we, we asked ourselves, what did they eat and how did they exercise? How did they live? to try to figure out interventions to reverse chronic disease. And <clears throat> at the same time, we looked at what could we follow inside the body that would allow us to have a, a metric of sorts to be able to ascertain uh, who was healthy and who was not. So we focused in on visceral fats and we used an MRI to quantify it and evaluate it. And then we looked at different dietary strategies and lifestyle strategies, exercise, numerous different things that impacted visceral fat. And we looked at what you know made it get worse, what made it get better. And after researching it for about uh, eight years, um, we ended up getting a, a grant from the National Science, a $1.2 million grant. And it was just the most interesting research. So I'm happy to share it with uh, some of what we learned uh, from that research with your audience. Before we get into all the nuances, the MRI and things like that, um, can you talk a little bit, like what is visceral fat versus subcutaneous fat? Is that the brown fat, the white fat that we hear a lot about? Can you talk a little bit about these fats, where they're yeah. located, why it matters? Yeah. So people kind of hear about visceral fat as like deep belly fat and people have a kind of a gestalt or feeling, you know, vagueness that it's a bad thing. It's a really bad thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is so bad that every form of chronic disease that we studied among 5,000 or 5,000 individuals went away or got better if they eliminated that visceral fat. So it, it has its tentacles in so many forms of disease. And what that is specifically is a deep type of fat that's within your, your, your uh, abdominal area of your, your belly, deep, deep around your viscera, around your organs. So it surrounds your intestines, your colon, your liver, your deep organs that you cannot see unless you do an MRI scan or you happen to have a surgery, um, then you could, you could see, you know, if they took photographs of it. Uh, but subcutaneous fat is the kind that people are more familiar with. It's the pinch, uh, the inch kind. So you can pinch it on, on your skin, you can feel that on your abdomen. And that really is not associated with any chronic disease. We didn't see any substantial improvement in health when people reduce their subcutaneous fat nor um, any uh, worsening of their health. But you, you know, the distinction between white and brown fat, both those fats are really probably more white fat, but brown fat is, is actually healthy fat. And uh, it's typically uh, kind of located within the, the neck regions and the, and the sternal regions and it's in most abundance in babies when they're born. We have a large amount of brown fat and it has, and the reason why it's brown is because it has a higher amount of mitochondria in it. And these mitochondria are very active and they actually promote thermogenesis, so creation of heat. So they help to regulate the heat of babies. So if you accumulate more brown fat, you have greater tolerance for cold. So it's a useful fat and also increased metabolism of other fats. So you actually can burn off um, and have a, have a better, healthier level of metabolism if you have a higher amount of brown fat. And you can actually convert your, brown, your white fat to brown fat, as we're finding out. So great question. I love for you know, people to find out that there are different depots of fat. There are different types of fat. There's also fat around your heart, pericardial fat, fat around your kidney. There's fat that will hopefully get into this fat that invades your muscle tissue, sort of like what you see when you might go to a butcher shop and you see marbling in steak. That's really unhealthy fat. And that corresponds to visceral fat. We see it in humans. And uh, hopefully we have a chance to, to take a look at what that that appears on an MRI. But yeah, very important questions. Um, you definitely do not want to have visceral fat. Subcutaneous fat just means that you're living, um, you're eating in excess of your metabolic needs. You're consuming more calories than you really need. You're not as efficient as probably you should be. 
Uh, but it's nowhere near as harmful as having visceral fat. And then how do the fats occur? So, you know, it's not like I decide, well, I want more visceral fat over the subcutaneous, or I want more of the white fat over the brown fat. How does that happen? It sounds like some of it's the processed foods, but. All right. So you're asking about processed carbs and their contribution to visceral fat. So it's been our experience when we did this research, again, scanning over 5,000 abdomens, looking at visceral fat and analyzing diet, in particular, doing different uh, specific interventions. So trying out processed carbs and eliminating processed carbs to see their impact on visceral fat. We were able to see, in some cases, just in just um, over a weekend, uh, the deposition of visceral fat from processed carbs. So processed carbs is my highest recommendation for my followers and anybody that I have an opportunity to influence, to be a part of like today, uh, being on a nutrition with Judy, I like to make the point of just how important processed carbs are to eliminate from your diet. So uh, maybe, maybe we'll take a look at a uh, picture of uh, processed carbs so you, you, you get an idea of uh, what, they, uh, what their contribution is. So this is a really nice case series of uh, a visceral fat on an individual who's 68 years old. He was an executive and we've colored, visceral fat doesn't really have a natural color, but we've added color through the computer. So you can see uh, the difference between visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. So subcutaneous fat, we painted in yellow and it's the kind of fat that's around your body is pinch, uh, pinch an inch kind. And the visceral fat is the deeper stuff in the middle. So um, what's of significance is the amount of visceral fat this gentleman has, and also the deposition of fat within the oblique muscles. So sure. these dark structures on the side of the muscles, and actually the same process that causes fat uh, to be deposited as visceral fat in the abdomen causes deposition of fat within the muscles. So it's all common a, a fatty uh, inflammatory process. So in two weeks, what's interesting at least to me, that in the untrained eye, so people who are watching this right now sure. can see themselves that the visceral fat has been diminished between right. here and here in just two weeks. And, and actually this view here, it's a little bit bigger. You can see the dimension here is they've gotten a little bit more narrow. And this is by way of orientation, the belly button, and these are the muscles in the back. So this is the vertebral column, but you can see his diameter shrunk from here to here. And then we go a little further down, 15 weeks, 25 weeks, and now at week 35, you can see he's diminished his visceral fat significantly uh, between when he got started 35 weeks earlier and 35 weeks to the end. So his whole shape changed and he actually developed a uh, Judy, a six pack. And what's interesting is that he developed this six pack and lost all this visceral fat from just doing the one thing, cutting out processed carbs. And he did not exercise one minute. So that's why it's really important to emphasize to people that when they have a weight problem or they have health issues, that the priority is eating healthy and not exercise. And that they're deluding themselves into thinking that by just exercising, they're really going to solve the problem. I, I tell them it's like shoveling sand against the tide. If you think that you're going to eliminate those health concerns just by exercising. So uh, another interesting analogy or important point that I picked up is these are the same slides, but now without the color. And I added this red line to emphasize that this is a measurement, okay? So these, you can see that this red line has gotten smaller each time compared to here. So what that means is the diameter of the abdomen laying down. It's called the sagittal abdominal diameter. I like to tell people, Judy, that's a poor man's MRI. I mean, you can infer visceral fat from doing that measurement. So an example of how that measurement can be done is if you lay down on a flat surface mm -hmm. and you take yardsticks, some cases you have to do yardsticks, some cases you can just use a ruler but you, and you do flat across on the abdomen, you can track what that diameter of the abdomen is laying down. And that number can be followed over a period of time. And you'll see that, that you can infer from that without doing an MRI scan that a person is losing visceral fat. And that's really important. I think that's a, it's a really quick and easy way that patients can, and, and your followers and people 
can just track their visceral fat and uh, see that it's being eliminated. So um, this is a device you can get off Amazon. It's called a radiology caliper mm -hmm. or an x-ray caliper. It's about $30 and it allows you, to, radiologists use it to, to measure distances on plates behind uh, people that are getting x-rays for various different radiographic studies. But in this case, I recommend adopting, I give it to my, my clients. I buy them one and, and I give it to them so they can track their own sagittal abdominal diameter. So uh, anybody watching can jump on Amazon. I obviously do not have any affiliation with this device or any devices, sure. anything that I recommend. I do not have any financial recommendations, but um, that's a, a really good uh, measurement for tracking and inferring uh, visceral fat. The other way that uh, visceral fat can be increased is through alcohol. So we see people that uh, may cut out processed carbs uh, or might do the other interventions. We studied lots of different things uh, such as sprinting. Sprinting really gets rid of visceral fat uh, as a, a better form of exercise than jogging. But uh, people that have persistent high visceral fat or accumulating visceral fat, even in the absence of eating processed uh, carbs, oftentimes it's from alcohol. So I'll ask them if they're, they're consuming alcohol. And usually it's a, you know, a serious um, alcohol user and they simply need to cut it out. And I, and I show them uh, what's going on and they're able to do it. The other uh, contribution from visceral fat is from stress. So stress causes increased cortisol. Mm -hmm. Cortisol signals to the body to store uh, fat. And very often it is stored as visceral fat. So uh, it can be subcutaneous fat, but oftentimes if it's unhealthy stress, it is going to be uh, deposited within the abdomen as visceral fat. We see that time and time again. And then a, a fourth way that visceral fat is is accumulate accumulates within the abdomen and or its dissipation elimination is is interfered with is uh, from sleep impairment. So if you're not sleeping well, you're just going to get a lot of a uh, uh, resistance to getting rid of your visceral fat, or you're going to accumulate it. So um, here's a case of a guy um, who had a huge amount of visceral fat. Uh, within within him, and this is I like to show this scan to let people know how important visceral fat is to image rather than just getting numbers. So if you can afford to get a dental MRI uh, or CT of your abdomen to track your visceral fat, I recommend it because um, when you get a number like in a lab test, we you know we uh, we get lab tests to help patients out. You know, I, over the years, I, I've done so many of them after 25 years of practice in medicine, but it's really rare that I get anybody motivated to do anything with a lab test, but it's extraordinary, the motivation that comes from a visceral fat scan. So when you look at it in cross-section, and, and th that's the reason why DEXA scan, I think, is basically almost a waste of money because the DEXA scan doesn't really allow you to visualize your visceral fat. It gives you a number, so it's it's just like a lab study. But when you can see the amount of visceral fat that you have in you, um, it, it just engages your, your cerebral cortex, your brain in such a profound way that it helps you to overcome, you know, the, the resistance to change and really motivates you. So in this case, this guy, I showed him healthy levels of visceral fat and then I showed him unhealthy levels of visceral fat. And then I showed him his scan. And he literally, Judy, passed out on me. He passed out and hit the ground, knocked over wow. two chairs. The nurses came running in. It, it, was, a, it was a really uh, powerful impact. And so, you know, I, thousands of people, I've just opened up their, their abdominal MRI scans and shared their image with them. And uh, it's just really a moving experience for them to see um, this enemy inside of them, how much oftentimes they have such significant amount of visceral fat inside. So uh, whenever possible, I encourage people to have abdominal um, MRIs to, to track that image and to actually uh, visualize it because it has, uh, has such, such a good effect. So maybe I'll just take time to show a nice MRI. This is a good mm -hmm. MRI. This guy has visceral fat here, the white inside, but not much. He's, he's only uh, 27 years old. He's got a six pack. He's got nice oblique muscles, very, very small uh, amount of visceral fat. So he's, he's a good example. People want to know what, what, what a good example of a uh, MRI is. 
And then a couple other really nice ones. So this is an NFL player, 23 year old professional NFL player. Um, just a little bit of visceral fat that he has. And this area down here is actually not visceral fat. This is retroperitoneal fat around the kidney. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not within the viscera. But this is the best scan. If people want to know what the gold standard is, what you want to look like if you get scanned uh, for the type A's in your audience that might be listening to this, uh, this is it. And wow. his visceral fat is just this little bit up here. Um, it's just it's a very, very small amount that he has. And this is not uh, visceral fat. We see this in, in really healthy people. But what's also noteworthy besides his, his paucity or a lack of visceral fat is the abundance of musculature. So mm -hmm. The other advantage an MRI gives the ability to quantify, you know, muscle to fat ratios. So we can see how much fat and how much muscle um, is present. And this guy has a little bit of subcutaneous fat. This is his belly button. That's why it's dark there. This is his belly button here, uh, but he is mostly um, muscle. So he's right. wall to wall muscle. And this is his core. If anybody is you know, listening and wondered what their core looked like when you do those exercises. This is the core musculature, the psoas muscles, and they're, he's literally kissing uh, from his back to his front, all, all muscles to his abdominus rectus and, uh, you know, the biggest uh, muscles uh, possible. So that's a really nice example, an introduction to MRI and visceral fat uh, to, to grasp and understand just how much and how important it is to, um, to, to track your, your visceral fat. And one other, I mentioned sprinting one other uh, minute, we'll just take a look at a client who's 58 years old, who had a lot, a fair amount of visceral fat. And he came back and he was, I was disappointed that he hadn't removed more visceral fat. That's still a fair amount of visceral fat in there. And he assured me he wasn't drinking and he wasn't cheating. So it wasn't eating processed carbs. He was eating, you know, foods in whole form, um, eating healthy. And uh, he said he wasn't having stress and he, he was sleeping fine, but he admitted to one thing that we had asked him uh, to cut out and that was uh, distance running. So he was a distance runner. Like I was, I used to be a distance runner. He was running uh, more than I was actually. He was running 10 miles a day wow. uh, for five days a week. So 50 miles of running, that's a, a good healthy amount of uh, distance running uh, on a weekly basis. So we finally persuaded him, look, you're in a, in a study for the National Science Foundation, and, and we really need you to, to stop running because it's part of the protocol that we look at high intensity, the, the impact of high intensity exercise uh, when a low, uh, low carbohydrate diet. And so he agreed to, so he stopped running here. And then in two months, it was even less than two months, he came back and what he did was sprinted between here and here. He stopped running and he only sprinted. So this is the, the significant impact that sprinting has when you start sprinting and you stop distance running. So we saw this time and time again. And so it, be, it became a regular protocol, one of our strategies that we continue to this day to recommend to people to make sure that they um, continue to um, uh, sprint and not do uh, distance running. So um, I may take a look at one other slide that shows some distance running uh, that uh, some right here, a client, uh, whoops, that doesn't show up so good, but the, all this red is visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And he had very little subcutaneous fat around. And this is a marathoner who was running eight to 10 marathons uh, a year. So you can see he's had a, a fair amount of visceral, visceral fat in there. But what was also significant is how much uh, sub uh, pericardial fat he had. So this is the right lung and the left lung here, and the middle is the heart. And we can quantify that fat, a uh, large chunk of fat around his heart. So he was a young marathoner, 34 years old, and had a significant amount of visceral fat. So from these images, we were able to persuade him um, to, to cut out the distance running and to become a sprinter. And the 68-year-old guy that uh, Judy cut out the carbohydrates, the processed foods, but wasn't going to do any running or sprinting for us or any exercise, he didn't exercise one minute. This was his heart. So he too had a big chunk mm -hmm. of fat, even larger chunk of fat around his heart. And not in 35 weeks, but just 13 weeks. So really just uh, three months, he came back and look how much he had diminished his pericardial fat on his repeat scan. So uh, pericardial fat 
is commensurate with and corresponds to your amount of visceral fat right. that you have. So I think it's really important for people to image their visceral fat. And, and for those who are listening, say, guy, you know, I don't know what my visceral fat would be like. I'd like to know. Well, if you've ever had an abdominal CT, so here's, so in this scan, you know, for your viewers, and I really, this is so exciting. I really want them to go back and and see if they've ever had abdominal CT, because you can see at least at that point in time in your life, what your visceral fat was at, at that time. So on a CT, abdominal CT, visceral fat shows up as black. So all of this black Judy is visceral fat. So on an MRI, it shows up as white visceral fat. On a CT, it shows up as black. So this person has a large amount of visceral fat within them. So yeah, go back. You can go to where this, the abdominal CT was. Either you did it through a doctor or through a hospital, and you can request that, and you can get the report. And I guarantee that nobody commented about the visceral fat. Right. It's it's there. It's it it cause it's causally connected to the biggest killers uh, today: atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes, and cancer. And nobody comments on it. It's an abomination. It's a scourge afflicting our healthcare system. And there's something really, really rotten about the fact that this sails right through. So that's why I want to educate doctors that are in training. And I want to train nutritionists. I want to train health coaches. I want to train people to read their own abdominal CTs, their own abdominal MRIs to look at that visceral fat because Currently, it's not being done. And so that's why I'm super glad to be on Nutrition with Judy and uh, be able to show, you know, just how important the uh, visceral fat is. Yeah. And there's so many questions. So one, can we go to a regular doctor and get these scans? Um, would a, our standard doctor, if I said, I want to get an MRI on my abdomen area just to get check visceral fat, would they even do that? Is it covered by insurance? Do I have to go to a specialist? Yeah. So great questions. You can go to your doctor. You can request it. It won't be covered by insurance. Okay. Unfortunately, insurance companies are not at all interested in imaging visceral fat. In fact, they don't want uh, at a, the highest levels. It won't, won't be discussed with the low levels, but at the highest levels, they're not going to do anything that promotes awareness of visceral fat because uh, so we every form of chronic disease we ever saw in 5,000 people went away or got better when visceral fat was eliminated. Do you know how much money we're talking uh, to the healthcare industry, the largest part of our economy, right. if we were able to eliminate chronic disease? And it's really starting with just eliminating visceral fat. So the health, health insurance companies are not going to do that. For those viewers, who, well, why not? They got to pay for all those bills. Here's why. Nobody in the health industry wants disease to go away. The reason is the more disease, the higher you're willing to pay for your health insurance. That's why health insurance keeps going up. More disease, they can charge more for it. They make their money on the policy, how much people are paying annually or on a monthly basis for that health, health insurance. So even, it's even, United Health Group talks about it all the time, their business, member payment per month, members payment per month. That's all they're tracking. That you know, some more disease, they they can get more money out of it. So the character uh, mayhem on all state inc insurance TV commercials, that guys, mm -hmm. like, you know, when there's mayhem out there, you'll buy insurance for your car. But when there's no mayhem and we have driverless operating systems and there's no car crashes, automobile insurance is going to drop to almost next to nothing. And these auto insurance industries are already trying to figure out what they're going to do. Uh, once we do that, because we're looking, you know, realistic for the first time in our country's history where nobody will die from car accidents in the future uh, because uh, driverless operating systems are going to are going to change that. Well, if if visceral fat gets out there and people become aware of this, it's going to so dramatically cut the costs of chronic disease that health insurance is going to dramatically cost drop the cost of it. And a lot of people aren't even going to get it because they'll just take the risk of, you know, have, you know, they'll buy minimal coverage or something for trauma or, or something like that. But yeah, that's, that's, a, that's what I try to do is bring awareness to visceral fat. And for those that want to go to their doctor and try to get a, vis, a, a, a abdominal MRI scan to track visceral fat, 
they can see if their doctor will order it, but they're going to have to pay out of pocket. You know, these and these MRI scans cost anywhere from a thousand to twenty five hundred dollars across the country. But if you pay cash out of pocket, sometimes you can go and get it. Like I can get it for my clients for for five hundred dollars. So you know, if you're able to get a discounted cash rate, pay for it out of pocket, don't look for insurance to, to cover it, it won't be covered. And uh, if you can't get it, they can contact me and I'll, I'll be glad to try to see if I can get them an MRI scan here in, uh, in Minnesota. But um, yeah, you're going to, you're going to have to pay out of pocket health HSA accounts, health savings accounts can, can cover this too. So a lot of, um, a lot of times I, I tell people to use their HSAs to their MRI scans or their CT scans. If you know, if you if you ever have a CT, I had one in the past, or you get one in the future, make sure you get a look at it and get that visceral fat red. Yeah, I think this is really powerful, especially people that aren't willing to change their diet because of some markers, right? Like maybe their cholesterol's imbalance or their A1C doesn't look so good. And they're just like, well, I just want to live in moderation and have some carbs and processed foods and I'm just living, right? And but if they see images which it's interesting because I've been looking into how to make a, a, like a talk more powerful. And they talk about a lot of these books and podcasts, they talk about how images are the most powerful way to convey a message more than data yeah. points and facts and numbers. And, um, and so it's so fascinating that I can see a family member, maybe like, maybe I'm carnivore and I am healing a lot, but my husband isn't. And so maybe if I just take a picture of his visceral fat it'll be enough to move the needle to motivate someone to change because you have a baseline of what should look healthy versus what theirs looks like. And that makes a lot of sense. I wanted to ask you about, um, I just wanted to make sure and be clear for the people listening and watching, but you brought up processed carbs. So what do you consider processed carbs? Um, is it all carbohydrates? Is it, um, you know, like what, what is that in the diet? And then in terms of alcohol, um, when you say they're drinking a lot, what does that mean? And I think it makes sense why alcohol will be just as impactful as processed foods, because they're broken down in the same that fructose model, they're broken down in the same way. And it absolutely makes sense why alcohol will impact it just the same. Yeah, so we'll start with alcohol, because it's nice and simple. If somebody really has never had a problem with alcohol, never had any issue, you better be honest with yourself. And if anybody has ever told you, you got a problem with alcohol, you better believe them. Okay. So if they've never had any problem with alcohol, then a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon might be okay. That's what I do a tiny bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I pair it with sometimes with some steak. And when I say a little bit, I'm talking like uh, a quarter cup to half, a, a quarter glass to half glass of red Cabernet Sauvignon. That's the lowest carbohydrates out there. Okay. But for my clients, any of them have ever had a problem with alcohol, I just, it's time to stop it. I mean, you, you, you've hit your liver enough. We can see the fatty liver disease and cirrhosis. Oftentimes it's present within it and on their MRI scan. So we just tell them to cut it out. And, uh, but yeah, absolutely no other alcohol other than the lowest form of uh, carbohydrates. And then with re, you know, regard to processing of foods, the best example I give is chunks of vegetables and chunks of meat. That's, that's what you can eat. Anything that's changed in form. And that leaves... Uh, you know, eliminates a lot of stuff, you know, processing is just so ubiquitous, even cauliflower rice, you know, taking cauliflower mm -hmm. and grinding it up, you know, causes it to, to raise your blood sugars yeah. faster and higher than if you eat cauliflower in whole form. So, you know, processing is, is something as, as easy as just grinding something up and, and it's exposed to air uh, as a consequence. Uh, and so it, it just, it has a higher capacity for being more inflammatory and uh, to spike your blood sugars higher and to have a higher insulinogenic response, higher levels of insulin. So, you know, I tell people that they can, you know, they can, that besides you and visceral fat, I, I wear a uh, CGM and they're, they're super popular. I've, I've had mine for almost five years now. And so uh, I've got lots of experience and I don't wear it all the time. I, I, I just, i like to study and I like to give it to my new clients so they can see that. But if uh, for those that, you know, are currently listening, you can get a CGM and you can talk to your doctor about prescribing you one. I prescribe them for my clients and that will give them helpful insights about processed foods um, in addition to um, having visceral fat. And, you know, with an MRI scan, we can scan, you know, every day. I mean, I 
used to have my own scanner when we had, when we were doing the study for the National Science Foundation. And we would scan people, you know, sometimes every day and track, you know, the influence on rice, you know, so rice is processed because oftentimes they remove the skin, the outer surface of, of rice to make it white. And even wild rice is still problematic and, and still bumps blood sugar. So I, I basically, especially the whites, potatoes and things like that and rice, um, I, tell, I tell them to cut it out. And my, my preference is eating vegetables, the, the lowest form and, and really the best lowest form of carbohydrates, lowest glycemic index are fermented vegetables. So I eat meats and I eat, uh, I like fermented vegetables mm-hmm. as a garnish, not as a huge, huge amount, but I like to garnish um, my meals with some, you know, some kimchi or some natto uh, or some, you know, kvass or some fermented sauerkraut. I, I find that uh, it pairs well. Sure. And I just feel better. If I eat consume meat without those, I, I don't feel as good. Like tonight I'm breaking my fast. I've been fasting for 72 hours. So mm-hmm. I'll go to an all you can eat Brazilian churrascaria restaurant. And I will bring like three or four little bottles of ferments and and some uh, some other probiotic, uh, you know, I bring coconut vinegar and, and apple cider vinegar and add it to some uh, San Pellegrino water. And that's, that's what I'll drink. And I, I will feel fantastic. But if I don't bring those things and I eat a bunch of meat, I don't feel as good. So it sounds like what you mean by processed carbs are basically carbohydrates or foods that are really increasing your blood sugar, which when then have an insulogenic effect. So the goal is really to not have those effects. And that is really what you're encompassing as processed carbs. Is that correct? That is correct. So okay. most of the time when you have that spike, when you process uh, carbohydrates and you get that uh, bump in the blood sugars and the um, bump in uh, and insulin where it's s- sustained over a period of time, mm-hmm. you'll see that contribution, uh, that deposition of, of visceral fat being laid down in the abdomen. There are people, interestingly enough, that can consume processed carbohydrates and don't spike their blood sugar and they don't get visceral fat. Okay. So there's an interesting study out of Israel that gave people chocolate brownies with icing and they uh, tested people for their blood sugars. And not surprisingly, most people's blood sugars went up. And in, in some cases, individuals' blood sugars did not go up. They did not have a, a glucogenic uh, blood sugar response or an ins- in, uh, response in their, their insulin um, that could be measured. And so what they found was they decided it was a microbiome study. They looked at, they sequenced the gut microbiome and they found common to those individuals that didn't raise their blood sugar, certain specific microbes. And um, it wasn't a causation study. It was an association study. Uh, so the next next phase of that study will be able to take those microbes, give it to people that were having previous blood sugar spikes to see if it conferred protective benefit. Now, from this study, I have heard it's not working. And the reason is these microbes are so delicate right. that it, they cannot get this to, to work. It's only in vivo that mm-hmm. these microbes will live within the gut. So nature is best. It doesn't look like we're going to anytime soon get a probiotic uh, of made of those particular microbes that, that's going to provide a protective benefit from glucose. So don't hold your breath. If you're listening to this, oh, there you go. I'm just going to wait for those microbes. Um, the probiotic, uh, you want to start eliminating those processed foods now and just start eating food in whole form. And, uh, but in the meantime, I'm really big on the microbiome. I really Mm -hmm. encourage people um, to spend a lot of time educating my clients on the microbiome to start living a life that is conducive to optimizing their microbiome as much as possible so that they can derive some of the tremendous benefit. And I think that's an area that physicians, um, health coaches, nutritionists, you know, therapists online in the health community have not done a good enough job selling people on the microbiome, the incredible mm-hmm. role it plays and the important role, because we still are in the infancy about it and we don't right. know as much about it, but you know, that doesn't mean you can't benefit from it now. You know, you don't want to wait to be a late adopter, early adopters are getting involved in uh, reading about the microbiome, understanding it and making healthier choices so that they can begin today uh, benefiting from a healthier microbiome. Yeah, I would have to agree. Um, I focus on root cause healing and I start with a carnivore cures meat only elimination diet. And the reason is, I mean, all disease starts with the gut. If you don't have good gut microbiome, the whole digestive process is broken. You don't have the proper building blocks. You don't have the nutrients that can be assimilated. So I fully agree with gut healing. And 
that's where I think a lot of people that eat meat only should challenge themselves over time and test foods like certain vegetables, certain, I guess, fermented foods, not that you want to eat it all the time or that you have to, but just to test how is your resiliency with health. And so that's why you should try other foods. And if you feel fine, but you're choosing to not eat it, that's a whole different thing than if you're sensitive to certain foods. So I'm completely on the same page with you. I have one question. So you were yeah. bringing up that the marathon running wasn't ideal compared to the sprinting. Is it because the stress of marathon running is too much for the body? Like why is? Yeah. Yeah. So what is it about marathon running? I, it was, I was encouraged to see that uh, Paul Saladino, carnivore MD on uh, Instagram, he just recently came out with a posting and he took some heat from it, um, okay. you know, criticizing, he was critical of uh, distance running and, and was a, a supporter. And I, when I was on with him on his, on his podcast, as a guest, we talked about sprinting. We went through some of those slides, how incredibly beneficial. So I guess Paul is, is taken to heart, you know, the, the importance of uh, sprinting, but what it seems to be is that when you exercise, you generate a, a reactive oxygen species, mm -hmm. ROSs. And these ROS molecules go through the body and they cause, ha they wreak havoc. So there is a sweet spot for exercise. Nobody really knows exactly what that is, but when you exercise too much, and now we, you know, more and more, we're finding that you can exercise too much. There is, you know, the, the capacity for humans to over-exercise. You stress your body and all this oxidative damage comes as a result of that. And when you sprint, you don't generate as much ROS is because it's a shorter duration. So the exact mechanism for this to happen has not been uh, well established by studies. So I just issued that as a caveat that we don't really know, but it's it's probably related to ROSs. And then somebody else is uh, Dr. Uh, O'Keefe. I think his first name is uh, James O'Keefe, who, who's a cardiologist. And he was recently on with Dr. Peter Atia, um, uh, Peter Atia is uh, the drive, and uh, Dr. Keith has uh, done YouTube videos and uh, TED Talks, and so he's a cardiologist who's warning about durational exercise, particularly distance running, and the harm that he's seen uh, in hearts. And we've all have had experiences where we've heard about people that are, you know, marathoners that suddenly drop dead of a heart attack. Jim Fix was one of the first back in the 70s when uh, where marathon running was just at its infancy. But uh, yeah, I think there really is something to it. And uh, I'm awfully glad. I'm very happy that I gave up distance running uh, to do sprinting exercise. And you would have a really tough time getting me to go back. But I, uh, I was a very serious distance runner and I love the endorphins that were provided me and I, it made me feel so good. And I thought it was causing me a lot of benefit, but I was, uh, I was a, ch a chubby guy. I was overweight when I was out there, uh, running. And so now I realize, you know, scanning all these, you can see, um, lots of soccer moms and gyms all across the country jogging on treadmills, uh, trying to lose weight. And, um, I oftentimes want to go and say, Hey, get off that treadmill and just sprint outdoors, save your money, just sprint, cut out processed foods. You got this, but you know, it's kind of unwelcome advice, but for the, for your listeners today, that's what I recommend. Do high intensity exercise, very short brief. And I like to like to say that, you know, if you look back over the existence of homo sapiens for four years, mm -hmm. there really was only two kinds of exercise or physical, you know, uh, events that really played a significant role in making us healthy and keeping us in the gene pool. And those two were how fast you could run to catch an animal, to kill it, need it, and how fast you could run to get away from an animal or predator that was trying to kill you. So as a defensive measure. So, um, and the, the other, so besides sprinting, the other really important physical trait you want to have that relates to that is fighting. So how strong and how well you could fight to kill a prey so that you had a source of food or how well you could defend yourself or your offspring or your, your fellow uh, clansmen, tribal, you know, pack people, whatever we called ourselves back then. So it's really fighting and sprinting. And of course, I can't recommend to, to people to go out and get in a bar fight, but you can exercise very intensely, uh, kind of emulating what a fight might like be like. And it's it's really high, highly intense in a very short period of time. And, uh, you know, uh, MMA fighters and boxers kind of know this, but 
you know, I, I was a former police officer and I once had a fight for my life with a bad guy that I, I really thought I was dying. I was going to die. And it was only about three minutes, but that was unlike anything in my life, those three minutes. And I realized that we just don't exercise like that. But that, Judy, was the life of our ancestors for 4 million years, right. those kind of struggles. And so we've just got away from this high intensity form of exercise. And so I try to tell that story to get my, my clients to really understand just how significant they need to, to really exercise. I can barely breathe. I think I'm on the verge of death when I, when I do my workouts and my wife can't even look at me. You know, she can't be in the room. So it's very short and very, very intense. And then I recover. So you really want to make sure that you're getting that high intensity exercise. In. Yeah, that's good. And I, I do think though, that if someone just never exercises and they're maybe out of shape, maybe they should work up to that so that it's not a shock on their heart and their system. Oh but, yeah, yeah. But in my research with my car, 